Take your Bibles, find your place in 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you would, tonight. We've been talking about the incredible power of kingdom authority, and we want to continue uh, our thoughts there about the authority that we have. We've been talking about claiming our authority over our three foes, over the world, over our flesh, and over the champion of darkness, which is Satan. And we have, we have victory through the Lord Jesus Christ over all three of these things. But we have to learn how to live within our authority. Learn to live with authority and assert our authority. To claim the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to stand upon His Word. Now, within the idea of dealing with kingdom authority, there are three major components that are key to our success upon which all of these things hang. There is the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, which we talked about the last time I was with you, I believe. The authority of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, and certainly not least, is the authority of the Word of God. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight, is the authority of the Word of God. Now, uh, let's read our passage together, and let's, uh, let's see what the, bar the Bible has to say about this very important subject of the authority of the Word of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. And there it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you for the opportunity to be together tonight and to look into your word and to study together. We pray, Father, that you would strengthen us in our hearts and in our minds that we might understand and I might have a settledness in our, in our hearts and our minds about your word and, and how it is pure and inerrant and infallible and how we can have assurance in your word. May you give us the authority, Father, may you teach us to take a stand in the authority that you have given us, for you have already given it to us, and you've given it to us in the name of Jesus and on your word, and Father, we pray tonight you'd help us to stand strong and firm in a world of shifting sand. Help us to settle the subject of your Bible in our minds and in our hearts, and when it is settled, may we stand. And may we stand true to your Son comes. We pray that you bless our church as we try our best to stand for your word and for your Son, Jesus Christ, in this day and age. May you bless us and protect us as we move forward. And we'll give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Everything in the Christian life hinges upon the inspired, inerrant, an infallible word of God. The Bible is our sole rule of faith and practice. And I want you to understand that I say that to you, and I, it may be redundant to you because in your mind, many of you are conservative, Bible-believing Baptists who have been taught your whole life that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. It can be trusted. And while you know those things, you need to understand that Satan has waged war on this very important topic. And he is, he is uh, undermining everything that has been laid in the foundation. While you might believe this, and while you and I might hold to this, there are many Christians today who are not settled on this subject of the Word of God and its authority and it being the sole rule of faith and practice. As a matter of fact, as we live and breathe, there are liberal seminaries turning out liberal Baptist preachers all over the Bible Belt of America who no longer hold to the fact that this is the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. Uh, and that seems like a strange concept to you and I, but it's happening all over the place. As a matter of fact, it wasn't so long ago that I had a church call me, and they asked me to come in view of a call, and I said, well, you have a, a ton of preachers over in that state. Uh, why, why aren't you pursuing them? And they said, we find that the preachers that are being turned out of our seminaries in our state are very liberal in their view of the Bible, and we don't want them. 
We want preachers who still believe that this is the Word of God, that it is a clear command from, from the commander-in-chief himself. So Satan is attacking us, and he is waging war about your Bible and what it means to you. There are attacks upon the Bible as the Word of God, not only in the Christian ranks, but especially in the Christian ranks. And so what we need to do as, a, as Bible believers and as a, as a church family we need to be well informed about this subject, and we need to settle the subject in our hearts and in our minds. And I want to share with you tonight some different opinions and views. Tonight will probably be different than any way that I've ever preached before. I'm going to take a little different approach tonight, but we'll see what happens. Now, we cannot live in total kingdom authority and in spiritual warfare without a total authoritative command from the commander-in-chief himself, uh, and that's from God himself. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who will prepare himself to battle? Friends, we have to have a certain sound. And what he meant by that is, of course, you know there were different signals and sounds that were given out by the trumpets to pronounce certain events and certain things. And if a trumpet gave a certain sound, you knew that the, the walls had been breached and the enemy was coming to prepare yourself for war. But he says that the trumpet gives an uncertain sound. How shall we know what to do? How shall we know to prepare ourselves for battle? Well, listen, friends, if we cannot trust the word of God, that it is indeed a more sure word from the king and the commander-in-chief himself, then, friends, what are we going to do? Where do we turn to and where do we look to to stand on anything? And if the thing is, if we can't look to the Bible, then, friends, we have no ground to stand on Paul at all. So we have to settle in our minds what the Bible says. Is to us. Now, I want to share with you uh, uh, some different views, and I'm going to try to share with you the best I can what these views are about in just a brief amount of time. Uh, there are a lot of different views about the Bible surrounding the Bible. The first one is the liberal view. The liberal view says that the Bible is man's words about God and other religious matters. Now, this is a very popular view. It, it, this view says that the Bible contains experiences and stories of pious men that can be described no better than as a collection of religious insights. Now, I want you to know something in advance. that These are not just open-minded, free thinkers, friends. This is an outright attempt to de-supernaturalize uh, the Word of God and the Christian faith. What, what they do is they, 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 they take the supernatural out of the Bible and say you don't have to believe all the, Bi uh, the Bible events and the historical accounts. But they, they take out also the bloodshed of Jesus Christ and redemption through His blood. And it becomes about reconciling social groups. Adrian Rogers said it best. He said the liberal view of the Bible is an attempt of mankind to make the world a better place to go to hell from. And that's exactly what the liberal view is. There's also another view called the postmodernism view. Now, this is an even lower level of liberalism. Postmodernism is a worldview that tries to do without fixed truth altogether. It's known as relative, the relativity of truth. What is your truth might not be my truth. And what my truth is may not be your truth. It just depends on what's relative to me or to you. This means that truth basically is non-existent, and what is true to one person may not be true to the other. Morality is dependent upon the individual. Whatever he or she decides is moral or right. And so uh, there's no middle ground. There's no black and white. It's just whatever you think, uh, and it's based on man's uh, own opinions and morality. I, I tend to believe what the Bible says, let God be true and every man a liar. I hold to that position. And then there's the neo-Orthodox view. Now, this is kind of a, a halfway house between the movement of the modernist and Bible belief. It's kind of a knee-jerk reaction uh, to the modernist movement. This is a school of thought that you don't have to hold to all the miracles and historical accounts of the Bible but we can still hold to some of the great truths and principles that the modernists have thrown overboard. Now, this view teaches that the Bible is the objective word of God because man cannot know God because he's merely a man. It also is a view that's confusing because they commonly use biblical terms, but they put their own definitions to those terms. So they're using our words with their dictionary. 
You understand what I'm saying to you? They'll use terms that, that, um, that sound familiar to us. As a matter of fact, Adrian Rogers in his book about kingdom authority said that when he was in theological seminary, he heard a man talking about the neo-Orthodox view. And he said, man, it sounded really good. It was, he said it was kind of a, a, a mush of, of different religious views. You could take some things. You could excuse some of the miracles of the Bible and say, well, that's just, that's just mythical stories. But, hey, there's some great principles and things over here. He said, I found out that they're using our words and their dictionary. He said, I'm having a conversation with one of my professors about the resurrection. And he said, uh, I, I thought we were talking about the resurrection. And he said, turns out, I was talking about the resurrection, and he was talking about something totally different. And he said, listen, you, you're, you're telling me you don't believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. He said, no way. He said, but in Christ Jesus, you have the right and the liberty to believe in a bodily resurrection. Why, I don't believe in that resurrection at all. Though he used the term resurrection. Listen, that, that's a theological smoke and mirror game. Take what you want. Don't take what you want. Have this part. It, this is not Burger King. You can't have it your way. It's God's way. It's either all his word or it's all a lie. And if I can't believe all of it, then I shouldn't believe any of it. How, how do I even know? Then there's the, to me, that's kind of the hippie Bible view. Hey, man, it's your view, it's your truth. Well, okay. Is it real? I don't know. Then there's the limited inerrancy view. Now, this view holds that the Bible is the Word of God and the Word of man. And you've probably heard of many of these. And you have to be careful uh, because you never know what view some people might have of the Bible. Now, this view, this part, the part that deals with salvation and faith, um, those are the words of God. But the parts that deal with culture, science, and history are the words of men. And it's left up to the individual to decide which is which. Well, isn't that handy? Then there's the Word of God view. Now, this is, this is where I camp out. The Word of God view, this is the view I hold to. This, this is says. I believe that the Bible is the Word of God, that God is the author of the whole Bible, that it is inspired by God, written through human agents. Now, see, we go back to our text, and it tells us that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. But here's what the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse, chapter 1, verse 21. It says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, what I find interesting about the Word of God is, it is that it is so complex and so deep and so complete, and yet it harmonizes oh so well. And Brother West and I were talking about this this week in his study, that the Bible is so well harmonized that it's hard for me to believe that even if man wanted to construct it in his own power and will, that he could even get it done as well as it's put together now. That the Apostle Paul maybe didn't even realize what God was doing through him as he penned books and did things and how the Bible harmonizes together. Inside the view, inside this view is inerrancy. That the Bible is without error and that it is just as God originally planned it. Now, here's what one man said. He said, if there be one mistake in the Bible, there may as well be a thousand. And he said... If there be one falsehood in this book, then you can rest assured that it did not, it did not come from the God of truth because he does, not, he does not lie or have fallacy. So if you've not settled this matter in your mind, listen, friends, you're never going to live in total authority over this earth, over, over this world, over your flesh, and over Satan until you settle this major component in your life. And you say, well, listen, you're talking to the choir. Yeah, but within that choir, there's always those people who have their questions and their doubts and their minds about the Word of God. And so we're going to look at some things tonight that may help us. Now, if we cannot trust the Word of God, then we could never speak, preach, witness, live, serve with authority until this matter is settled about this being the authority and the Word of God. Now, I want to talk to you for a moment. I told you I'm doing things different tonight than I've ever done them. 
I want to talk to you about what God's favorite name for the Bible is. His favorite name in the Bible, for the Bible, is the Word of God. Now, this is going to come into play in just a moment because we're going to compare the Word of God against itself. His favorite name for the Bible is the Word of God. The Bible records these words, The Lord said. It also records the Lord spoke. Thus saith the Lord, and the word of the Lord, over 3,000 times in the Old Testament alone. The Bible is the word of God, and it is as good as the word from the king himself as if he spake it to us today in our audible language, friends. Over and over and over again, thus saith the Lord. The Lord hath spoken. The Lord hath said. Friends, this Bible is the word of God as if he's speaking to us into our ears. Now, now you'll notice something as you deal with people. You will notice that as people become more liberal uh, in their theology, they will shy away from the term Word of God. And maybe you've never noticed, but if you spend time talking to people about the Bible, the more liberal they become, the more they shy away from that. They will use uh, terms like uh, the Scriptures. They'll use terms like the Pauline epistles and the records of God's revelation. Uh, They'll use those terms. And while those terms may be all good and fair, this indeed is the Word of God. And that's what God called it over and over and over again, the Word of God from the King Himself. So let's talk about a few things about this Word of God. We're going to move rather quickly don't be frightened by your outline okay we're going to move quickly there's no fodder in most of that it's all bible verses first of all let's talk about the absolute perfection of the word of god if the bible is indeed the word of god then it must be perfect right because it comes from the god of truth who tells no lies the god of truth cannot inspire error the adjective that is used in our text here in second timothy chapter 3 is used to describe how the Scriptures are given to us. He says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word inspiration comes from the Greek word theos nutos, which means God breathed. God breathes the words, and man puts them down on God's behalf. Man is moved by the Holy Spirit of God as God breathes out the words that he wants man to pen. This means that the words that God breathed out are indeed his words. Therefore, logic tells us that if God breathed them, then they must be perfect and holy and without error, or else God is not perfect and holy and without error. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? If a perfect God breathes them, then it must be a perfect word. The absolute perfection. Now, I want you to wrap your mind around this. Not only does God love to call his Bible the Word of God, he also called his Son the Word of God. Now, there is a connection here, friends, and we're going to connect the dots together. We're going to have a little children's chapel here with grown-up children. We're going to connect the dots between the character of Jesus Christ and the character of God's Word, because they are synonymous according to the Bible. Now, you say, well, why is this important? I'm not trying to bore you to death. I really ain't. I'm trying to give you some reassurance in your heart about your Bible that you carry. It's not just another book. This is important because there are Christians all over America who will hold to the fact that Jesus Christ is, oh, he's God in flesh, absolutely. But friends, he is also the Word of God. And if one's perfect, then the other has to be, too. And so they are synonymous together. And we're going to talk about this absolute perfection. And we're going to draw some comparisons and see how the living word and the written word are unerringly similar. First of all, both are similar in their concept. The written word is given by inspiration and is made a tangible object for man's good. The written word is is made tangible for us to see and to feel and to read, and it is given there by inspiration. In like manner, the living word, Jesus Christ, is made flesh, and he dwells among us for our own good, so that we might see him and know him and experience him. And, And we didn't, but we know people in the first century did. 
Both are similar in their con uh, continuation. The Bible says that the written word, it says, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Friends, it's going to stand forever. And people say, well, I have to learn and educate myself so that I can defend my Bible. Listen, friends, you ought to learn and educate yourself, and you ought to be a Christian apologetic person. But listen, you don't have to defend your Bible. Your Bible is like a caged lion. All you have to do is open the cage and let it defend itself because it's perfect and, in, and it's inspired. And it, it's going to continue forever. They have tried to burn this Bible out. They tried to throw it out and dismiss it and destroy it and dilute it. And friends, they, they have done a good job of trying, but yet here it is. And it still remains, and it is still quick and powerful and sharp. It's similar, and they are similar in continuation. While the Word of God goes on forever, the Bible says about the living Word that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. They are synonymous they're the same. The living word and the written word are, are, are inseparably linked, and their character is inseparably linked as well. Number three, let, let us see. Both are similar in creativity. Here's what the Bible says in, ele, in Hebrews 11.3 about the written word. It says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. There it is. So that things which are seen were made of things which do, uh, which do appear. In Colossians 1.16, the Bible says about the living word, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. So all things are created by the word of God, living, and all things were created by the word of God, uh, the written word of God as well. So they're similar in their creativity. D, they're both similar in their conversion. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says, talking about the word of God, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of a incorruptible, a incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth, how long? Forever. And then it talks about, in Ephesians 1, 7, about Jesus Christ, in whom we have our redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. So both of them are not only, not only are they similar in their conception, not only are they similar in their continuation and in their creativity, but both are similar in conversion. They're both a part of our conversion and our salvation. Listen, you can't take Jesus and leave the Bible behind. You can't do it. And all these liberal free thinkers who are undermining the word of God and say, oh, yeah, I love Jesus, and oh, he is the son of God, pure and holy and divine, and then they divorce the word of God, don't understand that these two are connected. They're very much alike. And I cannot take, I cannot accept the character of Christ and dismiss the character of the word of God, the written word of God. They're similar, and they're connected. They're both similar in cleansing. John chapter 15, verse 3, says, Now are ye cleansed through the word which I have spoken unto you. Talking about the written word. It cleanses us, makes us new. 1 John 1, 9, speaking of Jesus, says, For we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and what? And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the, the written word cleanses us, the living word cleanses us. Similar. Lastly, both are similar in their condemnation. The Bible says in John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me receiveth not my words. He hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Oh, friends, listen. Do what? We're going to be judged by what? By the word in the last day. Well, which word? His word. That's what word. Well, which one is it? Well, it ain't the one that the liberal thinkers are bringing up. It's the one that stood the test of time. It hasn't changed. Oh, and friends, we're not even going to get into the different versions of the Bible because we don't have that many months. 
but it's they're similar in their condemnation. Listen, friends, you better you better settle in your heart what you think about this word of God because you're going to be judged by it. But that's talking about the written word. What about the living word? The Bible says John 5, 20, 5 22, for the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto his son. Well, they're similar, aren't they? And yet all these liberal Christians taking Jesus and leaving the Bible behind. Listen, we cannot, we cannot divorce Christ from the Bible. That's the absolute perfection of God's Word. And listen, if God's Word is not perfect, then Jesus is not perfect. If Jesus is not perfect, the Word is not perfect. But if one is, then they both have to be. They're linked. The absolute perfection of God's Word. Number two, let's talk about the awesome power of God's Word. If we cannot do anything else to help us settle this, when you see the perfection of God's Word, then you have to feel the power of God's Word. Would we not expect the Word of God to resonate with and pulsate with great power? Absolutely. It's the Word of the living, pure, holy, true God who knows no lie, who can only link together something so good and pure and so uh, harmonized. So would it not pulsate with power? Absolutely. Matter of fact, Paul told us in 1 Thessalonians 2.13 that because the Bible is the Word of God, it can work effectually in men. That's the kind of power it has. Now I want you to notice some things that are going to be similar to what we just went over. Notice what the Word of God does in us. First of all, we're convicted by the Word of God. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the Bible says, For the Word of God is quick, and it is powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Listen, friends, it is the Word of God. The Bible says that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, it convicts us. It is our absolute perfection. It is our absolute awesome power that changes the lives and the hearts of men. And I want to tell you, I want to tell you why people are not being changed today, friend. It's because people are not preaching the Bible anymore. And when they do, people are offended at it. You know why they're offended at it? Because it's powerful. Because it's powerful. Because it's that mirror that I look at that shows me what I really am. Because it's that sword that's two-edged. It pierces my heart. I hope nobody from Kansas or uh, Kansas City sees this, but the first day of revival. Matter of fact, I hope they do see it. If you see this, I hope you see this. The first day of revival, I get up to preach. And one of the seniors, who is, I guess, a pillar in the church, that night his wife comes home and she says his name. said, he won't be here tonight. I said, well, is he, not, is he not feeling good? She said, yeah, I think his toes are hurting. And I said, well, boo-hoo. I said, hey, listen, I'm shooting at the devil. If you're getting hit, you're just standing too close, is all I can tell you. He didn't come back for any of the rest of the services. But you see, it's amazing. The Word of God amazes me. It amazes me how it affects people differently. And let me tell you how it, why it affects people differently. It's a heart condition. It's a heart condition. Because the, the open, good ground that's ready to receive the word, it can go into. And from that good ground can come forth much fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. Unfortunately, sometimes the word of God falls on hard ground, stony ground, thorny ground, and it's choked out before it can do anything. Hey, it's not because the power has changed, because that power is still there. What's funny about that service is while one man got mad and never came back, some people couldn't get enough. 
Some people were coming down the aisle weeping and rededicating their lives. And, and the pastor told me after the Tuesday night service, he said, I can't remember the last time our church moved like that. He said, I can't tell you how it blessed my heart. The first day he got up and wept. And he said, if, he said I thought you needed revival, but I needed it more than you. You see, the Word of God is still very powerful. It's, it convicts us. We're convicted by the Word of God because it, it can go places that I can never go in you. It can, it can touch the depths of a man's heart that I could never touch. I can't put enough inflection in my voice I can't use enough fanciful words and funny illustrations and witty comments to convict the heart to salvation. But the Word of God can do what I cannot do. Someone asked me today, he said, are you not preaching as much because you run out of things to say? I said, only intelligent things. I'm still full of witty humorisms and idiotic statements. Oh, listen, friends, when we're out of soap, the Bible still has power. We have to preach it. Or else we'll never see anybody change. It has power to convict. We're convicted by the Word of God. Secondly, we're converted by the Word of God. I talked about this in 1 Peter 1, 23, a while ago, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Hey, we're changed by the Word of God. We're, con we're convicted by it, and then we're converted by it. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We're cleansed by the Word of God. I mentioned this, John 15, 3. Now are you cleansed through the Word which I have spoken unto you? We are, number four, we are controlled by the Word of God. Now look at what it says back in our text. And when it says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and then it says it is profitable. Hey, listen, don't put your Bible on the shelf. Don't get saved and put your Bible on the shelf because your Bible is profitable. If you have something that is profitable, don't you get it down and examine it? If you have a product that is profitable to you, do you not patent it and sell it? If you have a, a tool that is profitable to you, do you not pick it up and use it? The Word of God is profitable and it controls us. And here's what it tells us. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. That word perfect doesn't mean perfect like you think of me, but perfect as in complete and holy and whole and mature. Thoroughly furnished in all, all good works. Hey, the Word of God helps control us. It tells us what is right, what is not right, how to get right, and how to stay right. You're looking for answers on how to run your life? The Word of God is your tool. Its awesome power helps to convict us, convert us, cleanse us, control us. And lastly, we are confirmed by the Word of God. The Bible says in John 5, 24, and we'll close with this. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not be in condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me. We're confirmed by the word of God. Listen, many Christians do not live with Christian kingdom authority because they don't know about the authority of the Word of God. We're confirmed by the Word of God. He that hears my word and believes is not going to be in condemnation, but receives everlasting life. You don't have to be a doubting Christian. You can be a shouting Christian if you'll just trust the Word of God to get you there. He that hath the Son of God has life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Whosoever believeth in me shall not perish, 
but have everlasting life. Not a doubting Christian, a shouting Christian. Living confirmed by, confirmed by the Word of God. Brother West has been preaching about the character of God and all of his attributes and nature. And he's right. He's right. A lot of people have a lot of strange ideas about God. And the reason they do is because they don't get those ideas from the Word of God. But the Word of God is there to help us, guide us, confirm us, control us, to correct us, to convict us. And it is upon those three things, friends, the name of Jesus Christ, the authority of the Holy Spirit, and the authority of God's Word that we can claim authority over this world. When you ask people, why do you believe what you believe? All because of books and movies and different preachers and teachers. You ask us what we believe and why we believe it? Because the Word of God says it. All of our authority is right here. I have no authority of my own. But right here we have all the authority we need to stand over this world. Where is your heart at on your Bible? You say, Brother Reigns, I've believed all my life the Bible is the Word of God. Well, good for you, but not everybody does, not even all Christians. In 1949, and I'll end with this story. As a matter of fact, Brother Sam, you can come on and we'll prepare for an invitation. In 1949, when Billy Graham, you ever heard of Billy Graham? Anybody heard of Billy Graham? Not a very famous preacher. He's a very young man. He said he harbored some doubts about the Bible. He said when he stood up to preach, there was a complete lack of power. He said he knew that there was an intellectual battle that was raging in his mind over the authority of the Word of God. So Brother Billy went up into the mountains outside of Los Angeles to wrestle with that problem there. He said, I was in great despair, but I had doubts and questions. He said, in my despair, I prayed, and I quote, Lord, many things in this book I do not understand, but thou hast said that the just shall live by faith. All I have I receive by faith, here and now by faith. I accept the Bible as thy word. I take it all. I take it all without reservations. Where there are things I cannot understand, I will reserve judgment until I receive more light. And if this prayer pleases thee, give authority as I proclaim thy word. And through that authority, convict me of sin and turn sinners to the Savior. I believe the Lord heard his prayer, don't you? As I preach, convict me of sin. Turn sinners to the Savior. Listen, and maybe you have doubts in your mind. Are you a doubting Christian? Maybe you doubted your salvation, not sure. Listen, the Bible tells us that if we believe on his Son, we can have everlasting life. Doubt no more. Come and trust in his Son. Maybe you're here today and you've struggled with claiming authority on the Word of God. Friends, rest assured that it is absolutely powerful. And it is absolutely perfect. It is synonymous with His Son, Jesus Christ. And you can claim authority over this world. Over your flesh. Over sin and over Satan. On the authority of His Word, if you would. Maybe you've struggled with it. Maybe you would do the same that Billy Graham did. Come and pray, God, what I don't understand, give me the faith to accept it until you show me more light. He'll honor that prayer. And if you'll search, he'll give you light.
son. Do you believe he was born of a virgin and came to live a perfectly sinless life? Do you believe he died on the cross to pay our sin debt? Have you accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Well, upon your profession of faith by the authority of Florence Street Baptist Church, obedience to the commission of Christ, I baptize you now, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost.